date today is? 18th of October. Um, let's see here. Roll call, please. Councilor Rowan? Present. Councilor Donovan? Present. Councilor Katarina? I'm here. Um, and can we have approval of the minutes from the last meeting? Move approval. Second. All in favor? Uh, is there any public comment on any of the items before the Ordinance Committee this afternoon? If so, if you could approach the podium and tell us who you are and where you live, that would be great. Now. Are you okay to speak later? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. How do you like that, Karen? <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Shoup. I've served on the zoning board for the last three years. Uh, I'm here in support of the code enforcement staff and to support the ordinance changes that Brian is looking to do. Uh, he was kind enough to send out a little spreadsheet here to show us, you know, how many times that we've been dealt with this frontage issue, the front yard setback, and the side yard setback. Um, we're hoping to have more board members here, but we're here to support Brian um, because I've, in the three years that I've served on the board, this is an issue that we see that comes before us. Um, sort of an issue, and I think Brian outlined it in his letter to you guys, where different towns face different issues. They dealt with this different ways. I think Brian is very qualified, and I think the town clearly has a good code enforcement officer, and there's a reason he's been employed here, and he's done a really good job. So when Brian puts the forethought into this, I'm going to listen to it. And at the three years that I've served on here, I think he told you how many times these type of appeals have come before us. Speaking on behalf of like the residents, I think his idea is to kind of cut back on the inconvenience that the residents are going to be facing who are in these sort of lots. I mean, what did he, you said today, Brian, there's 541 properties that are, that are faced with this problem. Hmm. Um, you know, these are residents who just want to maybe put a porch on their house or make a little alteration, but because of kind of these outdated ordinances and the zoning ordinances that we've implemented over the 20, 30, 40 years we've been here, they kind of have to jump, jump through this after hoop. I think Brian's trying to provide a good customer service here for our residents to say, hey, maybe we can try to change this so we don't have, you'd have to come to this first step. Uh, I think it's kind of inconvenient for residents when they want to do something sort of minor and they have to incur the cost of filing to go before the zoning board, take their time out of their day and answer all these questions. And it's a rather intimidating sort of process, I think, for some people who are just like, just wanted to put a porch on my house and now I have to do all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just here today to encourage you guys to take these changes and we're all in support of the zoning board. You know, I'm sure you looked at our last meeting. We've discussed this over the last couple of meetings that we've had and we're in support of this. Um, I think, I think as Brian explained, it's not going to maybe, it maybe will change the type of appeals, but I think hopefully it will eliminate some sort of what I feel is maybe sort of unnecessary appeals where it's kind of clear what is frontage, what is not frontage, what is side, what isn't. I mean, clearly our code enforcement office has a lot of experience and I feel they deserve the discretion and it feels like he's written out a good job to say he has the ability and discretion and would be able to do that without having them coming before the zoning board. Uh, I think it would be a good service for our residents as well. Thank Thanks. you, Karen. Anybody else? Hi, good afternoon. My name is James Hebert, Scarborough resident and vice chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And um, I won't have much to say. I couldn't put it more eloquently than Ms. Shoup just did just now. But um, again, looking at the quantity, there are 541 properties with this issue and really trying to uh, take a common sense approach to a lot of these folks, residents of Scarborough, taxpayers, who just and coming from the side of uh, they're looking for you know a small addition to their house or to, a rather a back deck or a porch or something like that to have them go through the entire process. I believe this is um, a great way for us to sort of streamline this and make it a little bit easier for the taxpayers so they don't have to you know go through the entire process and come out on a Wednesday night that could potentially you know be eight nine ten o'clock at night for them uh, just to ask if they want to add on a back deck to their house. So. Uh, again, I couldn't put it more eloquently than just previously uh, espoused upon, but um, that's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Um, I'm going to make a, a unilateral change to the agenda order. We're going to move item 7 up. Uh, that's the Mass Gathering Public Assembly Ordinance because Chief Thurlow is on a tight schedule today. 
So if the chiefs would, or chief would come up and tell us what you think. Good afternoon, thank you. And thank you, Assistant Manager, for getting that changed. I have another commitment I have to be to at five. <laughs> um, this is really just an introductory um, note to let you know that we will be coming back to the Ordinance Committee with some recommendations for changes to the Mass Gathering Ordinance. We found over time that there are a number of things that seem to fall through the cracks in terms of the types of events that come. Um, I think the ordinance originally was uh, modified for when we were having the concerts at the Scaver Downs facility, mm -hmm. the real large events, and, and uh, there's a number of protections in there that make good sense. However, what we've discovered is there are a number of smaller events that are happening uh, that may trigger the numbers in the population that would require a mass gathering event, but they really don't seem like they fit and, and would need all of the oversight and might be uh, more able to be taken care of administratively. Um, there are also some things that don't necessarily fall under it, but that we feel that we should probably look at regulating uh, a number of different events, uh, some of them on the public ways. There's some large uh, bike events and, and different things that require uh, public safety resources that don't necessarily fall under it. and. To be honest, I'm not sure how much authority we've got to regulate some of those things that take place on public ways anyway, oh, right. but there are a number of issues that we just feel that we need to get our subcommittee together and do a little bit of homework, and, and we just wanted to preview that the, there are some issues that we'd like to, to move forward with and, and bring to your attention. And I guess I, to help us in that endeavor, uh, I'd be interested in some feedback from the Ordinance Committee in terms of your thoughts on administrative approvals of some of these types of things. Is that something that the Ordinance Committee would be interested in, in hearing or, um, versus the very formal process now? And one of, the, one of the problems with the process isn't necessarily the process, it's the timing. A lot of times, uh, I think there's like a two-month requirement where folks have to apply, it has to go through uh, the council action, and a lot of times we're hearing about some of these, especially in the summer, you know, just a week or two or three before it happens, they're not aware of our ordinance, and, and uh, a lot of times there's significant investment made in some of these events prior to them even becoming, uh, us becoming aware of them, so. Mike, can you give me an example of an event that you'd be talking about that would come under this? I, I mean, are you talking about like the triathlon things and the races? Triathlon is one of the things that is, <coughs> It's happened in the past. I mean, there's a there's an event at the Rock Church. It's happening just in a few weeks where they, they are telling us they know they're going to have 12 to 1,500 kids at this event over a period of time. Um, there's there's traffic concerns that we're dealing with and we're working with administratively. Technically, that, that probably should go through the process. Um, we, they've had it in the past. We haven't done it. it. It's just one of those gray areas where we administratively, we as department heads, we don't want to be in a position where we haven't put something through a process that it should be or have somebody get hurt and, and have there be a problem. Uh, we'd rather proactively look at our ordinance and make sure that we bring things in line with where they really should be. I think it's served us well. There are a number of good reasons for it, um, but I, I think it needs a little bit of tweaking. Is there anything, Chief, that you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think you, I think you have it very well. Uh, anyone have an question? Yeah, Mike, you I guess uh, my question would be, would, would there be some kind of threshold where, you, where it would be no longer at your discretion, or would, would the, it, in your mind, be that, that it, anything really could be administratively permitted? Once again, I don't want to speak for the group because we, we have got a working group between the public safety departments and myself <coughs> and public works, so it's, it's a broad cross-section of the department heads. I think my thought would be that we would leave a formal mass gathering process in place for the larger events, mm -hmm. maybe tweak what the thresholds are to require council action, and maybe be able to handle some of the smaller events uh, or things that don't hit those triggers administratively. I, I think there is still a, a, a solid need for a formal review process for some of these larger events, in my own personal opinion. Um, and, and would any component of that be, or I, I guess I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the uh, existing ordinance. Is, is there a noise component or, or disturbance component or traffic component? That all of the above. All, all, all yeah, of them is what we're trying to address. There's noise monitoring, there's yeah. notifications, there's, you know, uh, waste, public safety, emergency yeah. medical services. There's, 
that's why all of the departments are involved. When these applications come in through the clerk's office, it gets disseminated out to the various departments to look at their section of the ordinance and make sure that the application is in compliance with our requirements or to set requirements that, um, you know, a lot of these envision facilities like, like the Downs, for example, when they were doing the councils, they didn't have adequate toilet facilities or refuge collection and those types of things. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, per personally, I would I have a lot of confidence in the professionals that to be able to make those discretionary calls. I don't I don't know that um, I don't know that there's an instance where I would think that the council would be better suited to to address them. But I, but potentially some of the bigger ones, just because they might be more sensitive politically, might might need to still go to council. But I yeah. agree that conceptually, I, I'd be supportive of that. Yeah. Well, mass gathering permits. They're presently issued by the fire department? By the clerk's office through a council action. Okay. Yeah, I'd be, I'm certainly okay with um, streamlining the process, mm -hmm. making it more user friendly for uh, people who are trying to run events. Uh, I know that, you know, having them making presentations to the town council, probably one of the least able bodied groups. To, to evaluate that. Uh, Councilor Rowan's comment about professionalism is absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, to the extent that we could streamline it and give more discretion and authority, and I guess the question you always have is, <clears throat> when will you know you've gone mm -hmm. too far? Uh, and are you really thinking about uh, submitting uh, a draft yeah. proposed amendment that would give us some guidelines. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I think we'd all would support seeing that because to the extent we can streamline and make it more user friendly, I think that would be a good outcome. I think you should expect to see draft language, maybe not by November's meeting, it, depending on what people have for timelines, but certainly by December we'd have yeah. some draft language started. There's okay. also some discussion about we have another ordinance called the Public Assembly Ordinance yep. and looking at perhaps um, doing away with that ordinance and creating one ordinance for, for public gathering. Oh. Um, that would be my sense too is I would want to see something drafted because I like to have parameters because oh, as you know when you don't have clear parameters it would they be, get... <laughs> wouldn't it be good to know where you kind of each side of the line these are the kinds of events and if you could provide us with examples, then I think we would be able to get a much higher confidence level that yes, those are, those are appropriately administratively reviewed uh, and those that are truly require a more formal review, uh, what those would fall into, what kinds those are. Sure. No, yeah, I, feedback's I, very helpful, I appreciate it. I, I think uh, one thing I'd like to add is I think that I'm not clear on if the current ordinance suggests that a, a mass gathering needs to involve all the departments, but if it doesn't, I think that even if it takes the more formal route, we need to make sure that it's going through to make, that it's being evaluated, mm -hmm. um, even if the council has to take action on it because it's crossed some threshold. Uh, our biggest reason for coming today without having a draft, uh, which we're going we're gonna to work on, but our biggest reason for doing that was to make sure that there was some appetite on the part of the audience committee oh, to, yeah. to look at and introduce the idea. Policy. Yeah. It's good. It makes a lot of sense. I think we're very supportive. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next traffic ordinance parking in the right of way. Chief Moulton, please talk <laughs> to us. We've had. Uh, We've had a situation that has come up um, that we've been, I think probably some of you are aware of, um, where we've uh, been called into question about the enforcement of vehicles on the side of the road that are in the right of way but not necessarily in the roadway. And um, we have, uh, it's always been my position to give the officers discretion for a number of different reasons, but um, more importantly, looking at what I thought was the intent of the ordinance was to make sure that emergency vehicles could pass and that we could do the things that um, needed.
needed to happen, which is, and we've kind of always used the side of the pavement as that guide. Uh, but we have had a situation come up where there has been uh, some uh, questioning of why we're not taking action in a situation where something uh, is being parked in a right-of-way, even though it's off from the pavement, it's actually on the right-of-way. And in looking at the ordinance, the way the, uh, and, and this could be the 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, prohibition, or it could be uh, different streets that have no parking at any time, um, but the way the, the ordinance is written it, uh, when the, in the definition of a street, way, or road, <coughs> it talks about the entire width between property lines of every way or place, uh, whatever nature, when any part thereof is open to the use of the public as a matter of right for purposes of traffic. Which in my mind means the right of way. Yeah. And um, so the person that's uh, bringing this situation forward is, is correct. We technically have a violation of our ordinance and we're not taking enforcement action. My concern is, is that if we start looking at this differently and I have to instruct officers to consider the right-of-way when it comes to these parking situations. There are many, many, many places in Pine Point, Higgins Beach, uh, all over town <coughs> where we would be writing parking tickets to people who are essentially parked in their driveway uh, because their driveways are small and Part of their vehicle is actually out in what would be considered the right of way. So we're here to kind of see uh, how the ordinance committee feels about this and, and see if uh, we should in fact make our ordinance more in line with what the current practice is or if you feel that this is in fact the intent you want this to be the intent of the ordinance, then I need to make sure that people realize all over town that they're going to be subject to parking tickets. Um, so Robbie and I met about this a couple of months ago, and and on your in your packet you had the piece of the traffic ordinance that was pertinent with highlighted sections, including the definition that Robbie just read, and then also. Um, Section 14, parking on paved or improved surface, because I thought that that was another space that we might want to be looking at. And then Section 25A, which is what Robbie briefly mentioned, that no all-night parking upon any street year-round between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. So the connection there is no all-night parking upon any street. We've defined the word street up above, right? right. So Robbie and I, um, we talked about if, there, if, if council, if ordinance committee and ultimately council were interested in clearly defining paved right-of-way versus non-paved right-of-way, that that might be one way to um, address this issue, as well as understanding that there would be circumstances in which, on a short-term basis, really we should be flexible with right-of-way parking. And that might include if your driveway, driveway was being sealed. You can't park in your driveway, but you still need to be able to park in front of your home, and therefore you may need to park on the right-of-way. We should probably be somewhat um, flexible when people are having a party. Mm -hmm. You know that driveways cannot accommodate all of those vehicles. And when people have large gatherings at Thanksgiving and Christmas of family, that's not always there. Um, but there, and that goes back to the larger point of, do we wish to continue to allow our officers discretion in when they choose to write a ticket or not? And, and do we want to kind of back up that discretion with slight tweaks? Um, so that's kind of the conversation that Robbie and I had a couple months ago and, and are looking for some guidance on. So what specifically are you looking for from ordinance today? I think that the first question would be, I, I think, and Robbie, please, do you want to answer instead, Robbie? Or? Oh, go ahead. Okay. I think some guidance on do you, I think the first decision to make is do we wish to simply enforce the ordinance that we currently have and, and change the, the way that our officers currently interpret that ordinance so that we are going to start um, writing parking tickets for vehicles that are within the right of way, whether it's paved or not? I think that's the first kind of, because if that is what you would like to do, then this conversation can stop because we have an ordinance and we'll simply enforce it in a different manner. So I, I, I think I would personally, I think it, uh, the interpretation that, that has been used seems much more reasonable than the way that the ordinance is written personally. Um, and I think that uh, changing the ordinance 
to reflect what we're actually doing would make a lot more sense. Explain that to me. <laughs> well, so <laughs> I don't think it would be reasonable for us to, to take a very, to, to read the letter of what's written in the ordinance right. and start issuing tickets to people in the driveway uh, when they're parked in their driveway that then their car happens to expand into the right of way. The right of way varies at times. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's hard hard to know. Um, I think that if you have if you are off the road and you're not blocking traffic, then why are we concerned about it? Why is our ordinance dictating that that you shouldn't be parked there? Ravi, is there any? Uh, Will's bringing up a good point. You know, what's the practical reality of this? Is there a problem that you can perceive of us modifying the definition to be the paved surface? Uh, mm -hmm. So that for parking purposes, if a person is not impeding traffic uh, and is not and is not on the paved surface, because I think that's probably those two probably should go together. Does that that doesn't open up a problem? Uh, not for me, Councillor. I mean, that's the way uh, we have our officers have interpreted this. Um, and that's the way we have operated. But unfortunately, we have a situation where somebody's uh, uh, essentially bringing us to why aren't we enforcing right. something right. that There's is, a, in fact, it, a violation of it our It says ordinance. right of way, which means yep. edge of property line to edge of property line. Yep. And if somebody's parked there, mm -hmm. then why aren't you ticketing right. those people? Right. And, and, and my, di my dilemma is, is that I don't feel comfortable telling our officers that in this situation, consider edge of pavement. In that situation, consider the right of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And I, I remember uh, up off in Judy Roy's neighborhood, there was somebody who was, you know, parking a caravan yeah. kind of vehicle yeah. on the side of the road off the pavement. <laughs> And, and that was pretty annoying to the, to the neighbors. So it's all in what, what are the examples that would cause you to say, well, we can't do that, versus, well, of course you should allow this. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what it comes down to, which a lot of times you're relying upon the discretion of the police officers to, to use good judgment. So I, I guess my... And this is overnight. These were like overnight right. parking situations. So they're out on the street. But you wheels can't be, off the pavement. Yeah, but you can't be in the right of way between... Two and six. Two and six. So... They were in violation. Right, so... But we could have the same situation, you know, with any street, not necessarily right. just the two to, to <coughs> six. It could be at Higgins Beach or something, or, or, right. or Pine Point or something like that, where... Uh, it's a street that's no parking at any time. And we've got the same situation where a car right. may be parked off the pavement right. on what would be considered somebody's lawn, but technically right. it's in right. part of right. it's in the right of way. Right. And the way this ordinance, the way this <coughs> definition is, that would be a violation. Well, what if, what if the uh, definition of streetway and road were changed, and I'm looking at planner and code enforcement here, because I know there's a there's a reason you have the rights of way as wide as they are, and that is you know ingress, egress, uh, snow, telephone whatever, poles. telephone yeah. poles, yeah. whatever you get going. Yeah. Um, does it make sense from a practical point of view to not have a definition that's this broad in this particular? part of the ordinance under these definitions, or is that going to affect other definitions elsewhere? That's a legal question. <laughs> I guess I can, uh, typically what uh, um, the ordinances will say is, you know, where, where language is defined in a particular right. ordinance, that's the meaning of that word. If there is no definition of, of that word, you go to sort of a um, you go to a dictionary essentially. So, so where in the uh, zoning ordinance we define street. Um, I haven't looked at this ordinance, the uh, uh, 
on street parking ordinance or whatever the <laughs> traffic ordinance, uh, it may be defined differently um, with some different language. So it, it right. can be defined differently without impacting right. okay. what we're doing in the zoning ordinance or site plan or subdivision or what have you. So it could potentially say, and I'm thinking of Mr. Diamond, since you do mm -hmm. have legal background, mm -hmm. you could have something along the lines of for purposes of this section or whatever, yeah right-of-way will mean, and then right. you won't have that conflict <coughs> between... Right, you won't be modifying it for the entire ordinance, where it might have a more appropriately different definition for other provisions. Yeah. You can definitely do that. Well, so I was just going to say that I, what, I, what I thought I heard was, was Bill give an example of a time where, you know, the, where the Neighbor, the neighbors in the instance where the caravan was parked mm -hmm. yeah. off the road, mm -hmm. but they were, con you know, actually all, all the instances. Actually, the, the example that um, uh, uh, Chief Moulton gave was was also that that it's really the, the neighbors are annoyed that you're parked in the right of way, um, and um, I guess my, my main concern is that I'd, I'd really like the um, the enforcement to reflect. The ordinance, and not not that not that people shouldn't have the judgment, but but I think it, it presents a, a perception of unfairness sometimes if, if people are somehow getting away with something because right. of who, yeah. who knows why. But well, hence my hence my recommendation to change the definition of right of way for these purposes. Yes, and that, all I wanted to do was was push on what Bill was saying earlier was the example that he gave about the right the right. Like, it, it, are we creating a, a bigger problem by now loosening, loosening our ordinance? No. One person's common sense is another person's arbitrariness. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Would it work well for you to have Robbie and Jay and myself come back to you with two or three possible solutions that mm -hmm. we think would work? That, yes. that so you'd have language to look at and language to work with, and those could come back at another meeting yeah. and you could work from there? Absolutely. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So we do that? Yeah. Okay. Everyone agree with that? I think that's a good way. That's great. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. Mm -hmm. But you've heard what our we've thoughts been introduced are. Introduced to the. Just, just one final point, just to put it in context. I'm not aware that there are widespread complaints. In fact, no. There's really one complaint that has been very persistent, and uh, we've tried to be responsive to, and our answers are unsatisfying. So that's really brings us what brings us here. It's not as if there are widespread complaints. Mm -hmm. Chief, would you concur with that? Thank yeah. you. Great. For so, that. so that wouldn't be would not like we'd be facing public outrage where we. I don't believe so. The ordinance uh, to, you, you to match have, more the reasonableness. You may have one resident still deal. unhappy with the interpretation. <laughs> uh, just to the point of definition, and I'm pleased to work with staff as well. But um, it, it may be useful to separate the definition of street or road from way. Yeah. Uh, but even working within that definition, the qualifier is right at the end. It says for traffic purposes, and I think it could be argued <coughs> that those purposes are for the traveling public. Right. Traffic purposes, mm. uh, so the the improved part is really the the imperative part. Okay. We'll work. <coughs> That's great. Thank you. That makes sense. <coughs> All right. Excuse me. I gotta sit back down here. All right. So let's see. Where are we? Zoning Board of Appeals. <coughs> front yard setbacks. So we've already heard from two speakers. Yeah, mass gathering. So we went here, right. and we got up there. Now we're at ZBA. Who would like to speak to this? <laughs> uh, well, again, thanks for putting this on the agenda. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't get you the, the data that you requested. I thought you wanted the data before you would put it on the agenda. Oh, well, <laughs> then yeah, I learned I it was on the agenda, and I had to go find the data. So <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> we're, we get it. We're, we're backpedaling hard. <laughs> um, it, and so I left, uh, I left this analysis in front of each of you. You wanted to know numbers uh, you know, as to how many of our variances that are heard um, pertain to multi uh, frontage lots or corner lots. In, um, and so I did a quick analysis. I went back as far as 2015 and, and I ran out of time. So yeah, um, it, it generally, as you can see, about 19, between 14 and 19 percent of the variances we hear in any given year deal with these kinds of lots. Um, and then we did a GIS analysis. Uh, Micah, uh, our GIS person, did a nice uh, uh, 
analysis and came up with the 541 properties in Scarborough that have two or three frontages on roads or public or private ways. And, and that with a structure, he also tallied the ones with structures that were within 30 feet of the edge of the pavement because typically our setbacks are 30 to 50 feet. Mm -hmm. So if you're at least within 30, there's a good chance you're a non-conforming existing structure. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to add a porch or add a deck, you might be coming in front of the zoning board to get permission to do that. Um, so hopefully that's of some help to you. And I, I put just a, some acronyms in there for the different types of variances mm -hmm. that we, we hear. And some of them, limited reductions, for example, are just uh, five foot side and rear setback reductions and up to 10 foot on the front setback. If, you, if you're asking for 12 feet, you can't use the limited reduction. Right. You go to a different one. So mm -hmm. just to kind of um, separate those. So I, I, as, as you, you um, I think, already received the letter that was drafted on August 10 mm -hmm. from the zoning <coughs> board, and really, much like the, the chiefs uh, before me, we're really just asking for your appetite to have us explore this and maybe come with some draft language on different ways to deal with multi-frontage lots that might give us some kind of an administrative tool um, to kind of weed out. Obviously, there's going to be, much like their situation, there's going to be triggers where we can't do it administratively, and it is going to require a variance appeal. And we're not opposed to hearing variances. It's not about limiting the workload. It's really about trying to make a more customer-friendly experience for people who want simple projects or live in very old neighborhoods where mm -hmm. everybody is is built 10 feet away from the right-of-way line and not 40. Uh, we have a lot of R2 districts that require a 40-foot setback, and, the, and none of the houses are right. more than 15. Right. So, you know, in those cases, you're looking up and down the street, and everybody's got a porch but you, and you want a porch too, but you're already, you know, at 20 feet, and all you want is a 4-foot porch, and you've got to come to the zoning board to get what everybody else on your street has. Those kinds of things, mm -hmm. I think, is, are things where we can look at maybe coming up with something. And of course, we'd have to pass it through legal to make sure that, that we are not running afoul of any legal um, issues. And I, I warned you I was going to ask this, so I'm going to look at Jay. <laughs> yeah, look at Jay, because <laughs> he's smart. He's smart. <laughs> <laughs> no, you weren't warned. Um, I, I know in, in my business in real estate, we're always dealing with this, you know, your front yard setbacks. And then if you're on a corner, you've got two front yard setbacks, and et cetera, et cetera. Is there a practical reason for why you have these front, and I'm going to ask you to answer this for me if you can, is why they have a role like that so that when you have two roads or, you're, or, have, or you've got even three roads uh, around a house, where that having to have a front yard setback on every side is required? Um, guess what I would say is that I wasn't around when the town of Scarborough decided to make that decision in the policy. Different it's town, pretty, but it's pretty common. Yeah, but different yeah. towns do do it different ways. Okay. There are communities that do have sort of secondary front yards, if you will, sort of say, okay. okay, your primary front yard, and they figure out which street's the primary street, and there's different ways of doing that. Say so that still has a 30-foot front setback. But your secondary street, again, once you determine how you're going right. to make that identification, has a a lesser setback. Um, so there are communities that have moved in that direction. Um, and I think, you know, the Zoning Board of Appeals is, uh, members have sort of seen seen some of the issues and um, I, I would support working with Brian and the folks at the Zoning Board mm -hmm. to explore the different ways we might think about this. I haven't given it a ton of thought, but conceptually as the town planner, I think, yeah, this is something we should probably take a look at. Okay. And I will um, just also offer that <coughs> As Brian just talked about, um, uh, there are a number of neighborhoods with, within our community that, you know, the majority of the houses or the lots are non-conforming to what the zoning is. It, and actually one of the provisions that's being talked about in the draft comp plan, and it's draft, not mm -hmm. yet adopted, but is really taking a look at some of these residential neighborhoods similar to what we did at Higgins Beach, maybe not to the same extent, but that's a discussion to be had another day. Um, but to really look at right-sizing the zoning to at least, you know, not necessarily make things easier and allow people to start dividing their properties um, 
in ways they wouldn't otherwise be allowed, but at least bring the zoning in line with what the prevailing uh, lot sizes are and setbacks are. Um, and so that is, that's one of the th uh, thoughts that's being germinated by the uh, implementation committee or the uh, uh, long range planning committee as they look at mm -hmm. the comp plan and, and trying to embed some language like that. So I'd say this is consistent with that discussion. Um, so okay, great. You guys have any questions? For in looking at the list uh, uh, from 2016, 17 and 15, 16, 17, 18, it looks like there are far too many variance requests than there should be, which tells me it's a problem. That, uh, that asking to solve what is a straightforward issue uh, uh, created because you're on a corner uh, that requires the ZBA to solve this because it's just, it's so difficult for ZBAs. They apply the strict five right. part test for a variance and most people come up short. But yet the practical reality is that it's justifiable because everybody else in the neighborhood has a similar situation. And I mean, I can see looking at the addresses, there's a predominant number of, of Pine Point, Prouts and Higgins Beach residences here. So. It's obviously created, in, at least in many of these cases, because of smaller lots, uh, where all the other lots in the subdivision are also small. So I, I would support being able to see ways in which to dramatically reduce the number of circumstances under which the ZBA is put in the difficult position of having to judge and say, yours is okay, but yours isn't. And that's not fair to the ZBA. Do we ever turn any people down on this? I would think it would meet the, at least the there standard been, of bringing it up right. to the uh, value of the surrounding houses right. or whatever. There, there have been a few denials, okay. but quite frankly, the ones that, the limited reduction of yard size, and you'll see probably right. more of those than any, right. um, the, that's really where these are coming into mm -hmm. play. But they still take the same amount of staff time, and they still cost the same amount of money to the applicant. And, and yeah, it's, you know, they're a little easier. To, the, the test is a little easier. Right. You don't have to pr prove uh, no reasonable return, and you don't have right. to prove some of those difficult things. Mm -hmm. But it's still, it's still an inconvenience for what most of the time is fairly minor uh, construction. Not always. Sometimes you know it's, it could be bigger. But mm -hmm. that, but that's the one that we hear the most, and that mm -hmm. one. Um, oddly enough, can happen almost anywhere because there's a lot of older neighborhoods where the development. Um, we had one right out on the Holmes Road, just just past the yeah. the racetrack, yeah. uh, was one of the most recent ones. Right. And I think what caused that is, at some point, somebody put a private road in right. where there wasn't one, That's and right. now we have to enforce that front setback. So that automatically somehow that happened, and the house became non-conforming as a result. Mm -hmm. Now that property owner has come to the board at least three times since we've been here just to do certain things that were, yeah. would normally not be a problem uh, to his property. So it's not always the beach, it's not always those neighborhoods, but those are predominant because I think, as Jay said, those are the ones that aren't right sized and that's what we did with Higgins Beach. Mm -hmm. we, we did a right sizing of, of that and that's helped a lot, but it's still in play. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is the character-based code for Higgins Beach, does that take care of the corner lot problem? It, it does to an extent because as you, if you recall, we did what Jay described. We were able to have a primary frontage and a secondary frontage. For example, the primary frontage gave a, a range of 18 to 21 feet of mm -hmm. setback and then you could build, you could actually build within that setback if it was a certain component like a front porch. Yeah. And then on the secondary, that was reduced to 12, <coughs> 12 to 21 feet. So you had a, a larger range. There are still properties that aren't meeting that and are still coming for variances, but not as many yeah. as there were, excuse me, as there were before. Yeah. So um, it's helped and, and I think something like that certainly is worth a discussion elsewhere in town. As, as Jay said, there's many different ways to, to skin the cat, but I think um, in my hometown, for example, there was an allowance for going on either side of the, the property and taking the average distance of those houses. Mm -hmm. So that could be done administratively and didn't have to go to the mm -hmm. board. Mm -hmm. If they wanted something more than that, they had to come to the board for it. 
-hmm. That's a, actually a good suggestion. Will, did you have any questions? No, no, I agree. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to put some draft language together. I'd love to. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, we'd love to see it. Any preference? Did, have you thought about any preferences which way you'd like to see it going? Or would you just like to see some different <laughs> examples and maybe I'd like to pick? see different examples. Different examples. Different okay. Examples. That would address the, the nature of what you're seeing. Will. Most, most prevalent. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I'd look to, you know, we're going to look to you most strongly for the recommendations. So okay, very good. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That was easy. <laughs> Uh, oh, penalties within the morning ordinance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's me. That's you. That's me. Okay. So um, I, when at first reading for the mooring changes, there was a question from Councilor Chiazzo about uh, penalties. Yeah. And it's a great question. So in the larger Coastal Waters and Harbors Ordinance, there is a section on penalties, but it references state statute. So the town does have the authority to, to assess a penalty, um, but the assessment goes to the court system. So it's not very, uh, it, mm. it's just not how we usually have an ordinance contain penalties. No. So mm. I went to, um, Coastal Waters and Harbors had a meeting last week, and we discussed that question from Councillor Chiazzo. The committee was rather um, unanimous in wanting more time to think about what would be appropriate penalties when we talked about, you know, the that the harbor master could have the authority to simply, if you violated, um, whether it was not having your your mooring on, I mean, that's been actually fairly clearly stated, you lose your permit, but if you didn't check your mooring, you know, would you lose your permit? And there was some concern that, um, you know, depending on the circumstances of, of the, especially concerning commercial activity, that if you had a commercial person who, for whatever reason happened that they didn't get their mooring check done by the right date, are we then costing them their livelihood by taking their permit? They want more time to, to think about what makes sense for penalties, but they've asked that Ordinance Committee could perhaps recommend to Council at second reading, which is the public hearing is scheduled for November 7, that the ordinance be passed as presented because they want it to be in effect for January 1, mm -hmm. but that yeah. they, as a um, Coastal Waters and Harbors Committee, are committed to having recommendations to the Ordinance Committee regarding what those penalties could be by late winter, early spring. But they just want some time to really think about what makes sense for penalties and how to best administer them. Sounds okay to me. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So then, just so I understand, then the penalties just wouldn't be in effect or, or they wouldn't go into effect until the change obviously was made or would they <laughs> then take effect the following year? So the penalties, what would happen, this is I think how we imagine this happening. So let's say that <coughs> in March, they've had time to think about it and the March Ordinance Committee meeting, I come to you and I say, these are the penalties that Coastal Waters and Harbors has recommended. You guys say, yep, we kind of like that. And then, you know, by the second meeting in April for council, we have first reading on. So we're just going to amend the ordinance right. again. Uh, so it doesn't need to wait a full year, but the penalties, but the town still has penalties associated with the larger ordinance. If there's something egregious, we still have the authority to to act. But um, it's just not defined yet. Exactly. Great. And so yeah. it'd just be a simple but amendment. But at least get at least get this started because sure, we've got that licensing coming. I, th I think we right fix away. a lot of things yeah. as is. Yeah. yeah. Given yeah. the time yeah. of the year, yep. right. uh, dealing with it come March, April is fine. Okay. So with that, um, I have it mailed letters mm. yet to current permit holders because if if you guys had said nope we want to have penalties in place before we move forward then there would be no right. reason to do that mm. so are you comfortable with me then yeah okay get them yep. all sooner rather than later yep. please because <laughs> we're going to hear from a few people i'm sure anything else that anyone has to say can i have a motion to adjourn moved huh? second all in favor? Aye. We're done. Thank you.